So this is my second attempt um, at the EAPI. Uh, before I get started, um, I'd just like to mention the programme, um, or the pathway that each of these programmes would have taken. Uh, these are both schools, both boarding schools. Um, as we know, they encourage sport from a very young age. Um, it is likely, or it's not unlikely, that they will have been given financial incentive to go to these schools. Even with the scholarship, um, it will be several thousands of pounds a year, and definitely more than 10, 15, approaching 20 really. But that's about half what it would have been. Um, so they're given financial incentive to be there. These are probably the two best schools in the country. This is Windsor Boys, and this is Clare's Court, the one I always forget. They um, have top Roman programmes. Um, and from here, uh, so some of these boys are internationals, so he's now an international. He's now an international, and he is now an international. So how this works is um, they will join the school in year seven, uh, or they may have gone to junior school, but they will start rowing in year seven. Uh, because if you do it beforehand, you get problems with your back, it's bad for your hamstrings, all that kind of thing. Um, so it's starting in year seven. Um, and work them all the way up until year 13. Um, from year 13, so up until year 11, at year 11 there's an international um, GB France match where I think several of these competed. Um, so they're already on the world stage there. Um, they'll be offered the scholarship again um, in sixth form. And this is the uh, Fawley Cup at Henley. So they're now 18, they're as old as you can be as a junior. Um, they will be, uh, he went international, he went international, he went international. Um, I think it was about three weeks later. Um, they went off to Belgium or something. Um, so, so as, as you can see, um, it's kind of a progression through the school to the international, back to the school, to the international again. Um, and that's helpful in terms of they get better coaching, all that kind of thing. Um, what will probably happen now, um, they tend to go to Oxford, Cambridge, Durham or Newcastle, um, the top row form centres in the country. Um, and from there they go international, so if they were at Oxford, there's many, many examples every year of people who go to Eton, then Oxford, and then um, the GB team. Um, or in this case Windsor, uh, I think I think one of them did it a couple of years ago. Um, but it, but it, but it's a very clear pattern. If you go to one of the boarding schools in the south, you you you, you join in the junior school, you race in year eleven for the international side, you go back to the sixth form, you race at four, you then um, race for GB again, and uh, then you go to a university which races internationally, or a lot of them go to America, race in Washington, um, or somewhere like that, on a scholarship, again, financial incentive, and then eventually go on to compete for the national side. So, let's get started. Um, they are just about to start. Uh, so from here, the tension will be building. They'll be really highly stimulated. Um, not overstimulated, though. I'll get to that. Um, during the start, the high stroke rate ensures the boat gets up to speed quickly. Um, this high stroke rate is made possible by the quadriceps, uh, specifically the rectus femoris. Um, it extends the knee along the sagittal um, plane of movement. Um, and this applies pressure f through the foot plate, um, which via the arm will be transferred to the blades and into the water, forcing the boat to be moved along at speed. Um, this is potentially a tactical point, um, you can see they've uh, put a kick in early, straight from the start, very aggressive start. This could be to get um, ahead, um, and not only in the race but uh, mentally. They um, Normally this man should be able to see the bat, the stern of um, the crew next to him. Not the man, the stern, so the edge of the boat in, in front. Um, he can't see that. And neither can the um, three man or the two man. So they know they're behind, that's a mental thing. Um, and it's, it's, 
it's hard to come back from that. It's hard to motivate yourself. They might lose motivation. They might think, oh, what's the point? What's going to happen? Oh, it was a bit right of the race. Um, which, which will impede performance. So potentially a negative uh, aspect um, for them, but definitely a positive tactic for them. Um, as I've mentioned, both of them are public schools, so they encourage sport. Um, the top rowers are idolised, which, which increases their motivation to um, be in the sport. Uh, also being a public school, they get better coaching, not to mention the international opportunity that they get for coaching there. Um, rowing. Uh, I speak the actual rowing movement itself is a gross, repetitive, discrete movement, um, which is also open towards the open side of the um, environmental continuum. Therefore, whole part, whole practice is most appropriate. Um, also, because it's low organisation, so you can easily split it into subroutines. So, how rowing would be taught was you would teach the general movement, the general whole movement, including the legs. You teach everything and then you take part of the stroke, you take a specific subroutine and you practice that individual bit. So you practice, I don't know, the catch for example. You catch where the blades enter the water. Now if you imagine as the blade is coming backwards, you want the blade to be, as you reach your full extension, you want the blade to be in the water and then in. And then you want to start pushing once it's in the water. Whereas if you start pushing too early, you miss some of the catch. And then obviously you can't apply your full force, you haven't got the right length, um, or you haven't got as much length as you possibly could have, uh, which will impede performance. So you, so, so you teach that part of the skill to get a really sharp catch in at the right place. Um, and then you go back into the whole movement, you teach the whole movement again with the added catch and you improve performance. Um, yeah. uh, the, everyone here, all the boys here, will be white males. Uh, this means they don't face prejudice faced by ethnic mi uh, minorities. An Asian male, for example, um, I don't know a single Asian male in rowing. There, there probably is one, but I've, I'm yet to see it. Um, and this means that um, he, he doesn't, it doesn't fit the social norms of the Asian um, social group, but it also doesn't fit the social norms of the rowing social group. So we'll also be seen as a bit of a outcast almost, or uh, an outlier, um, which would be hard for motivation, it means he's less likely to participate. Um, also these boys, being white, they're less likely to be affected by um, religious restrictions. Um, so for example, a, a Muslim woman wouldn't be allowed out wearing a skin tight like a suit, um, because it wouldn't be considered, um, it wouldn't be considered proper, it wouldn't be considered right, um, so she wouldn't be allowed to do it, and she'd be under pressure not to do it, which means she wouldn't be able to partake in rowing. Um, this increases performance for these boys by allowing them to train unrestricted, so they don't have to worry about social norms, or they don't have to worry about um, anything, so I'll speak, they can train in lycra suits, they can race, they can have their hair out, all that kind of thing, and it just increases performance. Um, they're probably going to be introverted. Um, this means they don't seek the social stimuli, which could potentially be damaging for performance. So, for example, an extrovert is more likely to go out on a Saturday night, drinking, partying, or, and um, as we know, that decreases performance. These, these boys probably won't be like that. Um, therefore, they won't have the decreases in performance um, because they don't seek that stimuli, which, which coincidentally allows them um, to continuously train for long periods of time because they don't seek the social stimuli of say a rugby training session, hitting a man or a hockey training session and scoring a goal, they don't care, they can just sit on a bike for two hours um, and work aerobically. I'm just going to pause it there for a second because they're going to finish before I finish. Um, the, the, um, this introversion is an advantage, not only because it allows them well, no, it's an advantage because it allows them to train for longer, which brings me on to the physical side. Um, it would cause cardiac hypertrophy. So uh, this, is inc this is increasing the size of the left ventricular wall, which increases the systolic force of contraction um, and in turn, um, stroke volume. An increased stroke volume would increase 
potential cardiac output. Um, so more oxygenated blood could reach the working muscles and the quadriceps, for example, um, allowing them to aerobically aspire for longer um, throughout the race, which is important, um, especially towards the end, as I'll get into. Finally, the last social point, all three, well, everyone here, most likely, will be middle class. Um, this is advantageous to performance because it provides better uh, funding for uh, equipment, for example. So that's an M packer, that's probably about £20,000. That's a Hudson, that's probably about £25,000. Both got carbon fibre riggers, um, carbon fibre blades, which are £250 each. Um, it's very expensive, and so the better equipment you can afford, the faster you will go. It has been proven. Um, also, they're less restricted by um, social norms as they would be if they were in the working car. So rowing is seen as an upper or middle class sport, um, especially from, from the stance of the working class, which um, means people in the working class are less likely to participate in it because they don't want to be seen as partial, pretentious or whatever. There's the stereotypes associated with rowing. Um, they but also they fit the social norms of the middle class. So that's again extra motivation, extra opportunity, um, allowing them to compete at this level. It's a very high level. These are the two fastest quads in the country um, at this age, at the junior age group. Um, th they've got through six rounds to be here. They've been um, racing all week. Um, yeah, so this is a semi-final. Um, also, towards the end of the race, so you can see the, the, the stroke rates start to increase. They start to increase in speed. Um, towards the end of the race, they've probably completed the road movement about 200 times. Um, therefore, FOG fibers are very important there um, because they allow aerobic um, contra contraction. Um, without producing as much lactic acid as an FG fibre, which will also be working. Um, but, yeah, so, the, so uh, speak, the movement is highly anaerobic, which means that um, more FOG fibres will allow them to keep going for longer because they won't have the limiting effects of the lactic acid. Yeah, um, so this is the final sprint to the finish. Um, they've put in a kick very, very late. I think they're only slightly up. They're about a metre up there. I think they're getting about another metre before the finish. Um, this is just mental strength. This is their going for it. They're probably going for the line. Um, yeah. So, tell me how it is. Uh, Winter Boys uh, win. Please feel free to comment. I, um, yeah. That, uh, that felt smoother than last time I did it. Um, but yeah, let me know. Cheers.